Excellencies, uh, distinguished delegates, we wish to warmly welcome participants joining in person and virtually to the seventh session of the Committee on Social Development. For participants who joined the session on KUDO, you will be able to turn on your microphone and camera only when your request to speak has been submitted and accepted through the platform. Kindly note that remote simultaneous interpretation of the proceedings is provided by the United Nations for the purpose of facilitating communication in light of the fact that there are six official languages of the United Nations, four of which are used at ESCAP. Participants are requested to be mindful of the additional difficulties experienced by interpreters when working in remote mode and of the increased likelihood of disruptions to the audio feed to the interpreters. Only the speech or intervention in the original language is authentic and constitutes an authentic record of the proceedings. In case of any, any inconsistency between the interpretation and the speech or intervention in the original language, the latter shall prevail. In addition, Interpreter servicing remote meetings cannot be held liable for interruption of service, pixelation, freezing, or loss of visual input, partial or complete loss of audio, audible artifacts, unauthorized access to personal or confidential data, leaking of information due to inadequate soundproofing or data loss. This event will be webcast and real-time captioning and international sign language interpretation are also provided during this session. Thank you for your kind attention. Now, it is my honor to invite the United, United Nations Under Secretary General and Executive Secretary of ASCAP, Ms. Armida Salsha Alice Jabana, to, de uh, to deliver the opening remarks. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great pleasure that I welcome you all to ESCAP and to the seventh session of the Committee on Social Development. This committee is being held at a critical time. While our region is still grappling with the consequences of COVID-19 pandemic, new and unexpected socioeconomic challenges have emerged in parallel to ongoing global trends such as climate change, inequality, population aging, and digitalization. These compounding and overlapping challenges risk the region's hard-earned development gains. While they affect us all, their impact places a disproportionate burden on population groups already in vulnerable situations. And furthermore, gender discrimination puts women at a particular disadvantage. Yet with the right mix of national policy interventions backed by political will and public support, we can mitigate these challenges and transform them into strengths and opportunities. With strong regional co collaboration, we can safeguard our planet and create inclusive and peaceful societies that support the well-being of all our people. To shed light on these challenges and strengthen the evidence base, we recently launched the Social Outlook for Asia and Pacific entitled The Workforce We Need. It discusses the importance of building a resilient workforce to better respond to these ongoing and emerging global trends and deliver on the sustainable development goals. The report has focused on three core building blocks for doing so, which are universal healthcare, a green and just transition towards decent employment and an extension of social protection to all. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, in addition to discussing how to build a healthy, protected and productive workforce, this committee will address responses to some of these challenges in three additional strategic areas, namely strengthening regional cooperation on social protection, accelerating implementation of the Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging, and accelerating implementation of the Incheon strategy, strategy 
to make the right real for persons with disability in Asia and the Pacific. Through the Regional Action Plan on Social Protection and recent ESCAP resolutions, you have affirmed your strong commitment to social protection. Yet, while investments in social protection have increased over the past two decades, too few people remain uncovered. Our region spends less than half of the global average, and almost 60% of our population has no financial coverage against normal life events, such as pregnancy, child raising, sickness, disability, unemployment, or simply getting old. The adoption of the fourth review and appraisal of the Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging demonstrated a commitment to accelerate its implementation and build a sustainable society for all ages. You express support for healthy aging, promoting and protecting the rights and dignity of older persons, recognizing older persons as development actors and for developing strengthening and implementing comprehensive policy frameworks that address and mainstream aging consideration. You also requested that ESCAP build capacities to gather, synthesize, and analyze age disaggregated data and support you in formulating forward-looking policies and we stand ready to do this. The ancient strategy to make the right real for persons with disabilities in Asia and the Pacific is the world's first set of disability-specific development goals, which was adopted back then in 2012. The high-level intergovernmental meeting on the final review of the Asia and Pacific Decades of Persons with Disability 2030-2022 to be held in Jakarta from 19 to 21 October of this year will provide an opportunity to review progress and achievement made in implementing the Incheon strategy and foster consensus on new strategic directions and renew commitments to disability rights and disability inclusive development in our region. We look forward to your active participation. Distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, in emphasizing the importance of regional solidarity, trust and partnership, I take the, op the opportunity to thank our UN partners, as well as our civil society organization and other stakeholders for your uh, collaboration. I also thank you, our members and associate members, for joining us at this seventh committee on social development. I wish you a fruitful and constructive deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ibu Armida, for your opening statement that has set the stage and identified priority areas to be deliberated on during this committee session. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, it is now my honor to invite His Excellency, Mr. Juti Kraira, Minister of Social Development and Human Security of Thailand, to deliver the opening remarks from our host country government through a video message. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, honorable guests, I would like to congratulate ESCAP on its 75th anniversary and to reiterate Thailand's commitment to work with ESCAP and member states to accelerate actions toward the common agenda. Thailand has come a long way in building a resilient society in response to the rapid speed of population aging and impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic. Thailand has implemented several plans and measures to support and protect the vulnerable as well as to improve the quality of life for all people. On this note, I would like to express my deep appreciation to ESCAP for their technical support and good cooperation during the past years. Thailand stands ready to work with other member states and stakeholders to bridge the remaining gap in order to better protect and empower the vulnerable so that they could enjoy a safe and dignified life in the society. I wish this meeting every success and look forward to its fruitful outcome. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency, for your valuable opening remarks. 
And I now turn to the Director of Social Development Division, Mr. Srinivas Tata, to conduct the election of officers. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, it is now my pleasure to conduct the election of officers for the seventh session of the Committee on Social Development. The meeting will elect one chair and two vice chairs. I'm pleased now to invite nominations from the floor. I recognize the distinguished delegate from Japan. Good morning, everyone. The delegation from Japan has the honor to nominate the following bureau for this meeting. For the position of chair, His Excellency, Ms. Ariunzaya Aish, Senior Advisor and Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister, Mongolia. For the position of Vice Chair, His Excellency, Mr. Boris Samheng, Minister Delegation attached to the Prime Minister and Secretary of State, Ministry of Social Affairs, Veterans and Youth Rehabilitation, Cambodia. And His Excellency, Ms. Sujila Mahat Siddiq, Permanent Representative to ESCAP of Malaysia. We are sure that under the able leadership of this distinguished bureau, all the tasks assigned to us will be achieved successfully. Thank you. I thank the distinguished delegate from Japan for the nomination. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, the distinguished representative of Japan has nominated for chair Her Excellency, Ms. Aryun Zaya Ayush, Senior Advisor and Chief of Staff to the Prime Minister of Mongolia, and for Vice Chairs, His Excellency, Mr. Boris Samheng, Minister Delegation attached to the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State, Ministry of Social Affairs, Veterans and Youth Rehabilitation of Cambodia, and Her Excellency, Ms. Suzila Mahmud Sidek, Permanent Representative of Malaysia to ESCAP. Would any other delegation wish to second the nominations made uh, by Japan or propose any alternative nominations? I recognize the delegate of India. The floor is yours, sir. Thanks for the floor. Good morning, everyone. The delegation of India would like to second the nomination made by the delegation of Japan. Thank you. I thank the distinguished representative of India for seconding the nomination. Would any other delegation wish to take the floor at this stage? I see none from the floor and none on the KUDO platform. I therefore have the honor to declare the following delegates elected to the Bureau for this meeting. For Chair, Her Excellency, Ms. Aryunzaya Ayush, Senior Advisor to the Prime Minister and Chief of, the, of Staff to the, uh, to the Prime Minister of Mongolia, and for Vice Chairs, His Excellency, Mr. Boros Samheng, Minister Delegation attached to the Prime Minister and Secretary of State, Ministry of Social Affairs, Veterans and Youth Rehabilitation, Cambodia, and Her Excellency, Ms. Suzila Mahmud Sidek, Permanent Representative of Malaysia to ESCAP. Excellencies and distinguished delegates, please join me in welcoming the new Bureau by acclamation. I now have the honor of inviting the Chair, Ms. Aryunzaya Ayush, to take her place on the rostrum and to conduct the meeting. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, on behalf of the Vice Chairs and myself, I wish to express our warmest appreciation to the distinguished delegates for the confidence reposed to us. It is my privilege to serve you as your Chair for the seventh session of the Commission on Social Development. 
I hereby call the conference to order. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, the pandemic has made it clear that no one is safe unless everyone is safe. Solving socioeconomic problems entails working together, sharing responsibilities, and disrupting costs and burdens fairly and equitably. This committee provides a stage for governments from Asia and the Pacific to do so. It is also gives us uh, an opportunity to share experiences, to examine our progress in achieving the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and strengthen multilateral cooperation at the regional level. The seventh session will deliberate on the need for creating decent jobs, achieving universal social protection and universal health coverage in the region. We will also discuss actions taken at the regional and national levels to implement the action plan to strengthen regional cooperation on social protection in Asia and the Pacific. Endorsed by this committee at its sixth session held from 20th to 21st of October 2020. We will share lessons learned and good practices in accelerating the implementation of the Madrid Plan of Action on Aging in Asia Pacific, in building a sustainable society for all ages. We will also review the progress in implementing the Incheon strategy to make the right real for persons with disabilities in Asia and Pacific and discuss measures governments have taken to strengthen disability inclusive development. As you have noted, we have a very packed agenda uh, ahead of us. I therefore kindly request your cooperation and tailor your interventions to, issued, to issues directly linked to the agenda items and keep these to no more than three minutes. As this is an intergovernmental meeting, standard procedures allow for interventions by government delegations from member and associate member states, followed by observer countries, then, if time permits, intergovernmental organizations followed by UN bodies and specialized agencies and civil society organizations and other stakeholders. Delegations present at the UNCC wishing to take the floor may do so by raising their nameplate, Delegations who are joining us virtually through QDO may ask for the floor using the functions available in QDO. Please note that the QDO chat box is to be used for technical questions only and not for comments. For those wishing to make comments, we request that you press the request to speak button in QDO and make your comments directly to the floor when called upon. The Secretariat will help compile the speakers list in order in which the requests have been made both physically and through QDO. Please bear with us in case there are any delays or technical glitches. Regarding the report of the committee, uh, only key decisions made during the session will be captured and considered for adoption on the final day of this commission, um, committee session. The proceedings will be captured separately in the form of an account of proceedings and annexed to the report of the committee session. Remote simultaneous interpretation, uh, interpretation of the proceedings is provided by the United Nations for the four official working language in use in ESCAP. Participants are requested to be mindful of the additional difficulties experienced by interpreters when working in remote mode and um, of uh, the increased likelihood of disruptions to the audio feed to the interpreters. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, I seek your cooperation in steering this committee session to a successful conclusion and ensuring that we achieve the results that are expected of us within the short, uh, the short time of, of our disposal. Together and with the able support of my vice chairs and colleagues at the Secretariat, may we look forward to rigorous discussion and achievement to the expected outcomes. We shall now uh, take up agenda item 1C, adoption of the agenda, as presented to you in document SCAP slash CSD slash 2022 slash L1. Are there any comments to the provisional agenda which has been circulated well in advance by the Secretariat? 
I see none, so the provisional agenda is adopted. I now have the pleasure to invite the Director of the SCAP Social Development Division, Mr. Srinivas Tata, to deliver an overview presentation for this seventh session on the Committee on Social Development. Please, Mr. Tata. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is indeed my pleasure to present to you a brief overview of the program for the seventh session of the Committee on Social Development for your easy reference and uh, so that it guide, guides you through the next three days. Next slide, please. Before reviewing the program for the coming three days, I would like to outline the objectives of this seventh session. As you have noted, we have a, quite a packed schedule uh, ahead of us. In line with its terms of reference, the committee will review several diverse but interlinked social development trends and challenges in the region. A particular focus of this session will be placed on the workforce, social protection, population aging, and disability. We will start by deliberating on measures to build a healthy, protected, and productive workforce and why this is critical for most development challenges and to leave no one behind, not least in terms of ongoing global megatrends. We will then discuss the progress, challenges, and ways to accelerate implementation of the Action Plan on Social Protection, which was adopted by this committee in October 2020. Thereafter, we will review trends in population aging and the situation of older persons in Asia Pacific, particularly in follow-up to our recently concluded intergovernmental meeting on the fourth review and appraisal of the Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging. Finally, the committee will review the progress made in implementing the Inchon strategy to make the might real for persons with disability in Asia and the Pacific with a view to informing the high-level intergovernmental meeting to uh, follow later in October this year in Jakarta, Indonesia. Next slide, please. Now, turning to the specific sessions to the of the coming three days, which are reflected in the tentative program which has been shared with all. Today, day one, and following this morning's opening, the committee will shortly consider agenda item two, namely strategies for building a healthy, protected, and productive life workforce in Asia and the Pacific. For this agenda item, the committee will have before it a background document that analyzes key social development indicators and ways to build a resilient workforce that can better respond to ongoing and emerging global trends. It concludes that such an approach requires universal health care, a green and just transition towards decent employment, as well as an extension of social protection to all. The background document draws on the recently published SCAP flagship publication, Social Outlook in Asia Pacific, The Workforce We Need. The session will commence with a keynote address by Professor Dean Carlin, who is the director of the Global Poverty Research Lab, after which the country dialogue will start. Delegations are expected to deliver short and succinct country statements highlighting national experiences and policies that have contributed to enhancing the resilience of the workforce, especially in the context of the 2030 Agenda and the Secretary General's report entitled Our Common Agenda. After lunch, in the afternoon session, we will resume our proceedings to discuss Agenda Item 3, which is strategies for strengthening regional cooperation on social protection in Asia and the Pacific. Under this agenda item, you will have before you a background document that contains an overview of the initial activities and measures taken by the Secretariat to support the implementation of the action plan in the region and to support member states. To kickstart interventions by member states, the session will begin with a high-level panel discussion on national initiatives taken to implement the action plan. Following this, similarly, delegations will be expected to deliver short and succinct country statements which highlight progress made in moving towards more inclusive and comprehensive social protection systems. Next slide, please. Now, turning to day two, tomorrow morning, the committee will continue consideration of agenda item four, namely follow-up to the outcomes of the Asia-Pacific Intergovernmental Meeting on the fourth review and appraisal of the Madrid International Plan of Action on Aging. For this agenda item, the committee will have before it two background documents. The first document provides an overview of the trends 
in population aging and the situation of older persons in Asia Pacific. The paper also presents a summary of the National Voluntary Member State Surveys which were submitted to ESCAP on the implementation of MEPA, as well as a synthesis of stakeholder consultation held in preparation for the intergovernmental meeting. The second document contains the outcome document of the intergovernmental meeting in ESCAP slash MEPA slash IGM3 2022 slash 3 add 1, which provides recommendations on building a society for all ages in Asia and the Pacific. This was adopted by consensus by member states uh, at the end of the intergovernmental meeting. We will start with a panel discussion on accelerating the implementation of MEPA in the region, and then this will be followed by country uh, statements uh, by delegations from countries, as well, uh, as well as other stakeholders. After lunch, for the afternoon session, we will resume our proceedings to discuss agenda item five which covers the review and implementation of the Incheon strategy to make the right real, as well as the Beijing implementation plan for persons with disabilities in Asia and the Pacific. For this agenda item, the committee will have before it a background document which contains a brief overview of the work undertaken by SCAP in supporting the implementation of the Incheon strategy during the last Asia-Pacific decade on persons with disability, 2013 to 2022, as well as ongoing preparations for the final review of the implementation of the decade, which will be held in October 2022. It will also contain a preliminary analysis of the priorities, achievements, and challenges identified by governments in implementing disability-inclusive development in the region. Uh, delegations will be all expected to deliver short and succinct country statements and also discuss issues and recommendations regarding future priorities for disability inclusive development as well as provide the Secretariat with guidance on the preparations for the upcoming high-level meeting to be held in Jakarta from 19 to 21st October 2022. We will close the day with agenda item 6, other matters. La next slide please. On our third and final day, the committee will have the morning free and reconvene at 1400 hours. The draft report of the meeting will be made available to delegations at 1200 hours. The afternoon session will be item 7, under which the committee will consider for adoption the draft report of this committee session. The committee session will then be closed. Thank you for your attention, and back to you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much, Mr. Tata, for uh, providing us a clear, succinct overview for this uh, committee session. I. Uh, now, uh, before we conclude agenda item one, I'd like to uh, invite the secretary uh, for, uh, of the committee to provide us some housekeeping notes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, may I provide some quick reminders for delegates, participants, joining us via the e-conferencing platform Cluedo. Uh, to select the preferred UN language, the language selector with drop-down menu is available on the left, lower left-hand side of your screen. When you want to make an intervention, kindly click Request to Speak button. When the chair calls upon you to take the floor, the microphone and camera icons will turn into red. Please click on Unmute the microphone and turn on the video uh, and deliver your intervention. Please do not click on Done Speaking until you have completed your intervention, as this will cancel your request. Once you have completed your intervention, kindly click Done Speaking. For technical issues related to KUDO, please kindly click Technical Support uh, tab under the messaging icon and type your message there. Our technician will assist you shortly. The Secretariat will be monitoring the messages in KUDO. However, the Secretariat kindly requests that all substantive questions or interventions to be raised through your delegation by using the Request to Speak button only. And finally, to prevent echoes and interference, please stay on the floor language when you speak and ensure all other devices connected to KUDO in the same room are turned off. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you so much. So now I'd like to uh, invite the Secretariat to deliver its presentation on agenda item. Two, strategies for building a healthy, protected, and productive workforce in Asia and the Pacific. As presented to you in the background document, SCAP slash CST 2022 slash 1. Under this agenda item, the Secretariat will make a presentation which will be followed by a video presentation which highlights the key findings of this year's flagship publication that was launched yesterday, the social outbook entitled 
the workforce we need. Mr. Patrick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to give you an overview of agenda item two, strategies for building a healthy, protected and productive workforce in Asia and the Pacific. This agenda item draws on our report, the social outlook for Asia and the Pacific, the workforce we need. The key findings are also summarized in the background document, SGAP slash CSD slash 2022 slash one. So, why are we focusing on the workforce in this year's issue of the social outlook? Well, there's three main reasons for this. Uh, next slide, please. The first reason is the shortage of decent jobs and the impact this has on people. Currently, some one billion workers in the region are poor or teetering on the brink of poverty. The main reason for this is that two-thirds of all workers are informally employed. In most cases, this means having a low and irregular income with no contract or no labor rights. It also means that most workers are excluded from social protection and healthcare services. This makes workers and their families highly vulnerable to systemic shocks, such as pandemics or economic downturns, but also to normal life contingencies, such as becoming a parent, falling ill, or simply getting old. Informal jobs therefore increase insecurity with negative impacts on life aspirations for generations to come. Next slide, please. The second reason is the importance of the workforce as an engine for development. The region's future depends on its labor force to power economic growth, generate tax revenue, and for companies to remain or become more competitive. However, informal employment is widespread in labor markets with lower productivity, which hampers economic output overall and overall development prospects. As such, it becomes a major bottleneck for economic advancement and for achieving inclusive and sustainable development. Next slide, please. The third reason is that ongoing megatrends such as climate change and technological advancement increase the need for green and digital jobs. This requires the workforce to be adaptable and to have the right skills to better meet the new demands. But few workers have the necessary skills, as highlighted in dark and light blue colors in the figure. This is particularly the situation in low income and lower middle income countries where informal employment often is the norm. These workers therefore rarely participate in any on the job training or skills upgrading and training. With rapid population aging, there is also a fast growing need for better jobs that cater to longer working lives and to provide access to healthcare and old age pensions. Next slide please. It's through well-functioning labor markets that the benefits of economic growth can reach everyone. Developing policies towards a resilient workforce with access to social protection and healthcare can help deepen solidarity and rebuild trust. Trust and solidarity are also fundamental ingredients for, an effective, and fair, for effective and fair policy reforms. Building a healthy, protect, protected and productive workforce requires advancing the decent work agenda and upgrading people's skills. To facilitate this process, active labor market policies should be expanded, improved and coordinated with social protection benefits. Along with the desperate need for extending social health protection to all workers and their families, there is an urgent need for universal social protection. This can be obtained, for example, by integrating contributory and non-contributory benefit schemes to provide all people with individual entitlements over their life cycle. Next slide, please. Distinguished delegates, for this agenda item, the committee is invited to review the issues and recommendations contained in the background document, SCAP slash CSD slash 2022 slash one. It's also invited to share experience on actions taken at the national level to build a workforce that is adaptable and better prepared to face future challenges while contributing to a more inclusive, prosperous, and sustainable future for all. Finally, it's invited to provide the Secretariat with guidance on areas for future research and policy support. Next slide, please. 
Before I give the floor back to the chair, I would like to take this opportunity to screen a short video on the key messages and the recommendations of this year's social outlook. The report is available outside the meeting room with the exhibition, as well as on the ESCAP website. Ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for your attention and uh, ask if we can please play the video. Thank you. In Asia and the Pacific, among the 3.2 billion women and men that make up the working age population, 2.1 billion constitute the workforce. Their work generates tax revenues to pay for essential goods and services. They ensure the well-being of dependent family members and power the economic growth needed for sustainable development. But our region's workforce is under pressure. There are insufficient, decent jobs. Two-thirds of all workers are employed informally, without a contract, often in hazardous conditions. Many are paid inadequately. The majority have no access to social protection and health care. Half our workforce survives on five and a half dollars a day, on the brink of poverty, at the mercy of pandemics, disasters, and economic downturns, or normal life events, such as falling ill or becoming pregnant. Health care is inadequate. 60% of workers finance their own health care and receive no sick pay. This is bad for workers' health and heaps physical, psychological, and financial burdens on them and their dependents. More people in this region are at risk of being pushed into poverty by health spending than anywhere else, causing inequalities to widen and lowering productivity and economic output. Social protection is lacking. Only a minority of workers in the formal sector contribute to a social protection scheme. Where benefits exist for others, they are often too low to cover basic needs. Excluding China, two-thirds of the population in Asia and the Pacific have no social protection whatsoever. The COVID-19 pandemic has pushed over 240 million people into poverty. These vulnerabilities have pushed workforce productivity below the global average. In response, we need access to decent jobs, universal health care, and social protection. Decent jobs require the formal sector to expand and to be governed by international labor standards. Active labor market policies must support lifelong learning, enabling workers to adapt to technological change, to new green jobs and to longer careers. Training tailored to participants' needs and responding to local labor markets can be passports to decent employment, particularly when combined with cash grants and social protection. Universal health care should be extended gradually, making sure that lower income groups are covered. A focus on primary health care as well as curative health protection is needed to improve health, worker productivity, and active aging. People who are chronically ill or live with a disability must be included into healthcare strategies. A package of universal child, old age, and disability social protection schemes set at the global average level would slash poverty in our region. And by guaranteeing income security and access, it would improve the workforce's resilience. Greater coverage of old age pensions would allow older persons to live independently and in dignity. Extending social protection to all means increasing public spending between 2 and 6 percent of the GDP. For most countries, this is a significant but affordable increase, but that requires the reprioritization of existing expenditure, taxation system reform, and the extension of contributory social insurance. Decent employment for all and an expansion of social protection and health care should be the foundation for a new social contract between the state and its citizens. One where mutual roles and responsibilities are clear and where workers are given the security to fulfill their potential across Asia and the Pacific.
Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Anderson, for giving us this overview and very informative video. I wish to mark the launch of the SCAP Social Outlook report, the workforce we need. Uh, I would like to commend the Secretariat for this excellent report. I am very much convinced that this report will help us uh, as we strive to build a healthy, protected and productive workforce in Asia and the Pacific. I would like to congratulate you. Before going forward, people come and go, but the pictures stay. So I'd like to invite you all to have a collective picture with the ES together, and please uh, provide us uh, notes how we do that. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I wish to first invite the Executive Secretary, Chair and Vice Chairs to the Committee to the center stage uh, in front of the rostrum uh, for a photo op to, launch, uh, to mark the launch of the so Social Outlook. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I would now wish to invite the heads of delegations to join uh, to join to join um, the uh, Madam Chair and uh, to to take a group photo. Thank you. Sorry, if, if uh, all the heads of delegation could please join the centre stage to, uh, for a group photo. Thank you.
So now with this, uh, I would like, and I have the honor of inviting Mr. Dean Carlan, Professor of Economics and Finance at Kellogg School of Management, Northwestern University, to deliver the keynote speech via the pre-recorded video. Mr. Carlan is also uh, the founder and uh, president of Innovations for Poverty Action, a non-profit organization dedicated uh, to discovering and promoting solutions to global poverty problems. Mr. Carlin led the graduation of the Ultra Poor Program, a combination of social protection, health, life skills, and uh, livelihood programs in the Philippines, funded by the Department of Labor and Employment of the Philippines government. The floor is yours. Please start the video. Hello. Hi, my name is Dean Carlin, and it's a real pleasure and honor to be here with all of you, well, to sort of be here with all of you, to share some thoughts about social protection and some of the goals of the United Nations in this regard, with, um, and I'm going to try to bring in as many examples as I can from Asia Pacific and some of the work that's been, been going on. Um, broadly speaking, I'm going to share two ideas with you on, on two different domains that fit under social protection. The first has to do with social protection for income generating activity, efforts to try to bring in and make more inclusive the economic activities in, in society. And the second is about healthcare and the importance of universal healthcare and expanding access to healthcare, but not just expanding access, but expanding quality healthcare. And these two issues are very intertwined that we, um, they, they affect each other tremendously. And that's some, one of the themes that hopefully I would like to leave with you all with today is that we thought of that in a silo was probably not the ideal strategy from the global perspective or from the country level perspective. And, and that these issues are very important um, to think about how they interconnect, particularly when we think about, for instance, on social protection, on the income generating side, how much, how important self-employment versus employment is in the formal sector and how there's you know lots of enthusiasm and excitement to of course and try to expand the formal sector but in many cases the self-employment is the only viable path and so what can we do to improve self-employment and then of course when there's self-employment sometimes access to healthcare services are more limited and hence these are very intertwined issues um, and there's nothing, um, nothing more stark than COVID-19 in terms of making it salient for us all how intertwined healthcare is with economic livelihood. So first I want to talk about graduation programs. These are social protections for the ultra poor. The basic premise of the quote graduation model for social protection in terms of economic livelihoods is that the cause of poverty is complicated that hopefully is not a very controversial statement to make. What's slightly more controversial is to say that it's because of the complicated nature of poverty that singular approaches usually have mixed at best results. And by singular approaches, I mean cash transfers or microcredit or training programs. And then when these are done in their silo, it's not to say that they can't have some success. And there's certainly examples of each of those having some success but the results are mixed and that may be particularly when dealing with the ultra poor that there's multiple constraints that are kind of beating everyone down at the same time and a multifaceted approach might actually prove more effective so the graduation model which has a few different names to it productive inclusion livelihood plus cash plus basically takes an approach which starts off with a market analysis and a targeting to really reach the ultra poor the most vulnerable it starts off by usually providing some consumption support. It might be overlaid, in, for instance, in term, on top of a cash transfer program. There might be um, some life skills coaching, and then some savings promotion. And then here's often considered the thrust of it and the most expensive part is technical skills training and a lump sum asset transfer. In many countries, this lump sum asset transfer was um, lively, I'm sorry, livestock. Um, more recently, we're seeing a lot of push to making those cash lump sum transfers um, because of the, the advantage of cash when operating at scale. Um, so the program 
we have seen tremendous success, but not universal, um, as this chart hopefully shows. So this shows you the results from seven different randomized controlled trials, six of these here, this, these, the six from Ethiopia to Peru, were all part of a paper, Banerjee et al., that um, put these together and published these in Science in 2015. And this first one is a study in Bangladesh published in 2016, with, as you can see, very similar results. Now, one thing that you might might be struck here is the end line one here is at two years, and the end line two is at three years. These are all results from a randomized controlled trial, all showing the impact on consumption for the household. And one of the main takeaways that I hope you leave from this is, wow, the three-year results are pretty much the same as the two-year results. The results persisted. They lasted. The other takeaway you might have from this is that there's a fair amount of variance over space. Just look at Ethiopia compared to Honduras. Honduras did not work. One of the most important things is that when we talk about best practices, we have to also learn from our failures. Best practices is to learn, to accept failure, but to document it and learn from it and embrace it and move on and try to figure out how to improve. We don't always learn from just mimicking the best. Sometimes we also need to see when things don't work because every context is different. And so if we just copy the best, we sometimes without paying attention to the things that don't work, we might actually not do so well. So one of the other aspects that was striking about this program is its impact on psychosocial well-being. This is going to be a theme I'm going to come back to uh, a few different times. This is... Um, um, mostly indicated by the mental health, but a lot of these are also separate indicators of uh, thought about, about capabilities. And by capabilities, what we refer to is the ability to do more with less, to do more in terms of achieving goals, in terms of improving your own life and those around you and your community, but without introducing the kind of normal, like it's not, it's the, it doesn't get started by having more cash, or more information, but just more capability for the household, for the individual in terms of their own fortitude and mental health to do more with the existing resources they have. And here we see a lot of consistent evidence across these different metrics, across these different sites of this program, improving different aspects of what we think of as capabilities. But one thing to note is the program doesn't work the same for everybody. So here's quantile regressions, which show you that the top quintile is working really well, and the bottom quintile, it's still positive. It still has a positive effect, but it's a much smaller treatment effect than those at the top end. Um, and so what we're seeing is that there's clearly evidence that says this works great for some, less so for others. Now, how do we figure out who these people are that are these different parts of the distribution is really important. And then figuring out what can we do better for the people who are lagging behind. Um, so in Asia Pacific, we've seen now randomized control trials in Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and the Philippines, all finding positive impacts from this program. So in West Bengal, we're actually seeing evidence of impact all the way up to 10 years. So this shows you the 18 month, three year, seven year, 10 year, control group in red, treatment group in blue. And as you can see, if anything, the treatment effect is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. This is for consumption, same thing for income over here, and same thing for food security. One of the questions that persists with this is how can we make the program work even better? Group training is one of the ideas that many have put forward, partly because it's cheaper. If you can have one field agent work with 20 people rather than one at a time, you might be able to accomplish the same goal with less money and then be able to help more households. It also helps a human capital challenge, and a lot of programs that want to scale this have a difficulty because of just the mere quantity of staff available to go into the field and engage in this program. And, but there's a trade-off, potentially, that there's less customization and less privacy, that if they're dealing with a group of 20, they're not able to give that kind of tailored attention that someone who's the most vulnerable may actually need in order to help solve the problems that they're facing. Group livelihoods also hold the promise that there might be economies of scale in enterprise, but of course there might be more challenges in trying to create groups to accomplish livelihoods rather than just a household at a time. So in the Philippines, we set up a test across these, uh, these different 
types of ways of implementing the program. And so these are results that are a bit preliminary from the Philippines where we have the dark green is the control group and is the value of productive assets a year or so later after the program was launched. And then the green is the group livelihood and group coaching. And so the this program was this part of the program was actually delivered a little bit later than the rest. So the cleanest comparison here is T2 and T3, individual livelihood with group coaching, individual livelihood with individual coaching. And the striking thing here is how similar they are. Value productive assets, they're basically the same. Monthly income, slightly higher, but more or less the same. Very, very similar results across these metrics. But one of the things that's striking here is that the group coaching thus does actually win in this because it's so much cheaper to deliver the program that way. And we actually have finding very similar results between in there as a very similar study in Uganda, where we have exactly the same variation of individual coaching versus group coaching, and we find the same results. In a bit of a more war-torn area with a lot of conflict issues to deal with in Afghanistan, the program has also been proving to be very successful. After one year, we see consumption is increased by 29%, poverty rates fell by 25%, and big impacts on assets, psychological well-being, time spent working, financial inclusion, and women's empowerment. Several of these are the kinds of things we think about when we think about capabilities. We see big improvements there as well. Um, but one of the things to note is that a lot of this is coming not just from the asset transfer, but from the full package. So here's a study in which we were able to tease out how much impact do we get from the full program versus from GOATS alone. And so one of the things that's striking here is the full program does lead to, when we look at just the value of GOATS that the household has a few years later, a bigger effect, but not that both work. But the striking thing is when we look at the livestock value excluding goats, we actually see a reduction in the household. These are the households that only got goats. They just received goats and nothing more. And so what you see here is a big treatment effect still from the full graduation program and a negative effect from livestock. So they were doing more goats over here, but they got rid of some of the other livestock. And when you look at the total value of all livestock, no change. Um, and the full program, though, we do see a 51% increase. Likewise, when we look at consumption and all other outcomes, we see no impact two to three years later after just transferring goats. So what that tells us is that the program was not just relaxing a capital constraint, a liquidity constraint, that the other components were helping to build capabilities, whether it's through information or through through uh, self-reliance and, and sentiments of self-reliance and, and aspiration that this program did lead two to three years later to more positive impacts. So some of the key policy lessons from this, first of all, that often short-term humanitarian is what's considered social protection, but we should also be thinking about long run, not, not for the exclusion of humanitarian issues in the short run, but as well as. And that sustained income improvement from multifaceted programs can work, can, we can see this happen. But many questions do remain. How do we optimize these components? Can we use technology-based interactions to lower cost, homogenize delivery? How do we target particular vulnerabilities, for example, refugees? How does it compare to cash? And how does it interact with health and mental health capabilities? So that leads us right to access to healthcare as a second important pillar in any social protection plan. So broadly speaking, I'm gonna give you some examples from the demand side, um, and from the supply side of, of health coverage. On the demand side, what is the evidence we have about the importance of cost, information, and trust? On the supply side, how, how, how have community health workers um, been affected? Hard to reach areas, telehealth, digital health. These are all different ways of trying to improve the supply of services. One of the most important things to realize with supply of services is that it's really critical that we think about it, both at about quantity and quality, that nearly reaching households with healthcare is meaningless if the quality of the healthcare they're receiving is not good. So the first lesson hopefully should not surprise anybody who's been shopping ever. Price matters. Price matters for us. Price matters for everyone. And so here's just a very straightforward collection of, of several different studies showing you the basically a demand curve. What happens when you drop uh, look, premium costs for getting health services, health insurance? 
across the board, systematically, we see exactly what we frankly should expect to see, which is price does matter. If you want more people to get health insurance, lower the price, subsidize it. And there's huge public reasons why we want everybody covered by health insurance, not just because of thinking of it as a human right, but also thinking about it as creating a more equal and functioning and vibrant and productive society. Um, you know, one, one piece of evidence comes from increasing, that's on the demand side. On the supply side, community health workers have proven in many different contexts to have tremendous impact as a nice supplement to existing health services. Um, if one example from, from Uganda shows the, the cost through a community health, work pro, health worker program to avert death, to avert infant mortality, was, was nearly around five $6,000. This is actually a very low cost, and it just came from having more community health workers on the front line identifying problems that households have and bringing them into the healthcare system. So really tackling that last mile through a good network. So here are some more examples from the Asia Pacific. So um, this is an example from Indonesia where subsidies and assistance. So here the evidence was that it wasn't just about price, but it was also about information. A full subsidy enrollment was up by 18.6 percentage points in health insurance, but overall enrollment rates were still low. And one of the key barriers was just yeah, an informational barrier about having the proper documentation. But um, it's also the case that there's a lot of misinformation in the, in, in going on. Hospitals, in some cases, this is an example from India, were charging when things should have not been charged and patients were unaware. So there was a program that tried providing better information to patients so they knew what's actually covered, what's not, what should you be charged for. And this led to some important changes about switching hospitals, bargaining with the hospitals, and reducing out-of-pocket payments. So it's not just as simple as subsidizing, but sometimes also you need to make sure that people know what's been subsidized. What, what, do, you, what do you have a right to and what do you not in the current healthcare system? But things are also a problem on the supply side. So monitoring health workers' attendance and performance can elicit greater effort in the short run. Here's um, evidence from a few different studies about monitoring devices, reducing treatment interruptions by 25%, increasing attendance among medical staff by 15%. But one of the challenges is that whenever you have a monitoring system in place, you got to think creatively about how it could potentially be worked around. And, and try to, it's a little bit of a cat and mouse game with the system and all of the various workarounds. And so that, that is, I think, an ongoing challenge in this space is to, is to develop better and better monitoring systems. Um, so, you know, overall, the, 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 you know, some broad lessons are to work on all sides of the problem. You really have to work on the demand side, which comes from reducing costs, increasing information, um, we have to work on the supply side by working more of the last mile problem, like commu using community health workers is one approach, but also that coverage alone is not enough, and the quality of healthcare services could not happen. So putting these all together, social protection, it's an interconnected world. There is no silver bullet, but capabilities may be key, and this is a, there's a loop here. From, with better health, we have more capabilities. More capabilities can lead to better economic livelihoods, like labor supply, work ethic, work harder, more you know, more energy. With better economic livelihoods, you can buy better health for not just you, but those around you, your family. And then with better health, better capabilities, better economic livelihoods, and on and on. And this is a, a, a virtuous cycle. And if we can, if we can make happen. Can, can really be exciting. And of course, if one of those links is broken, you can see how it could fall apart and create poverty traps. And so this is, it's really important that we work on all steps in that, in that link. And, um, and so with that, I'll, I'll close and just thank you again for this, um, for, for inviting me to give this talk. And if there's anybody has any, any questions, by all means, please do reach out. There's many different ways to apply these basic ideas to social protection policy. And I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you. Thank you so much. I very much appreciate Mr. Uh, Dean Kalan for his uh, 
through provoking speech um, that underscored the key challenges facing um, the workforce at the regional at the region today and the critical way of finding inclusive um, solutions. It serves us uh, as an um, important insight as we begin deliberation on this uh, pertinent issue today. I now have 50, uh, around 50 minutes uh, of um, country dialogue time. So I'd like to invite countries to uh, raise their hands if they have, um, if they wish to speak. Uh, those who are in um, the room, they may raise their hands, as also we are getting uh, through CUDO, um, the wishes to speak. Uh, I may remind you about the three minutes that you have for your intervention. I would like to uh, invite first to, uh, per, um, to speak um, participants from China uh, through CUDA online uh, system. So the statement uh, will be given by Ms. Jia Chao. Please, the floor is yours. China is not ready yet, so please, I'd like to invite the next speaker, Indonesia, Ms. Ali, uh, Mr. Ali Said, Said. The next to speak is a representative of Bangladesh. Please be prepared. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning, distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen. The government of Indonesia is committed to the promotion of an adaptable, better prepared, more inclusive and prosperous workforce in order to achieve stable and sustainable growth. At the national level, Indonesia has developed further strategies toward building a healthy, protected and productive workforce, including the universal, universal health coverage for workers in all sectors. The next, to promote the livelihood of vulnerable groups, the Pahlawan Economy Nusantara or National Economic Hero Program targets women as part of the government's work plan to increase productivity and transform an inclusive and sustainable economy through micro, small, and medium enterprises, which is the key to economic growth and post-COVID economic recovery and long-term financial stability. Indonesia continues to empower the unemployed, persons with disabilities, and the elderly through the social rehabilitation assistance program and vocational training program, which provides access to capital, access to markets and investors, as well as business management assistance. The online transportation service sectors and home online business sectors are considered as an alternative business opportunity for the less fortunate skilled workers who have experienced layoffs. The government continues to guarantee social security for workers by providing various legal regulation, including work accident insurance, health care insurance, pension insurance, severance pay and death insurance. PPS ASIC Indonesia support the policy by collecting relevant information on workforce through the National Labor Force Survey or SACRNES. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Representative of Indonesia. I'd like now to invite in a Representative of Bangladesh and then afterwards, uh, Representative of China. Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, a very good morning to you all. It's my pleasure to speak the Bangladesh statement on strategies for building a healthy, protected, and productive workforce in Asia and Pacific. My paper highlights the strategies 
initiatives and legal and policy framework of the government of Bangladesh in building a healthy, protected and productive Bangladeshi migrant workforce. Currently, 120 million Bangladeshi migrant workers are employed in 170 countries around the world. Over the past five years, including the pandemic period, on average, close to 77 million Bangladeshi migrant workers went for overseas every year. The Ministry of Expatriates, Welfare and Overseas Employment plays the key role in ensuring the welfare of Bangladeshi migrant workforce and protecting their rights. The ministry contributes to the social economic development of the country through expanding overseas employment opportunities, ensuring safe migration, protecting the rights of migrant workers, and enhancing welfare for migrant workers and their families. In order to build a healthy, protected, and productive workforce, the Ministry of Expatriate Welfare and Overseas Employment has developed its institutional, legal, and policy frameworks in line with the Sustainable Development Goals 2020-30. In line with the SDG Goal 8 for ensuring decent employment and economic growth of the migrant workforce, following institutions, laws, rules, and policies have been developed in Bangladesh. Institution Framework, Bureau of Manpower, Employment and Training has been established. Its vision is to ensure safe and regular migration by providing skill development, training, and welfare support to the migrant workers. Wage Owners Welfare Board has been working to promote and protect the rights and interests of the migrant workers and their families by providing with monetary, legal, and technology supports. Bangladesh Overseas Employment and Services Limited ensures fair and ethical recruitment and employer pay model in sending migrant workers. For example, this company is sending technical intern and caregiver to Japan without recruitment costs. This organization has also sent migrant workers to Jordan and South Korea, maintaining fair and ethical recruitment. Prabashi Kollan Bank is a state-owned specialized bank for expatriates through which investment loan, reintegration loan, and other financial services are being provided to the migrant workers and their family members. For instance, the Pulli Kollan Bank has provided collateral free soft loan at 4% interest rate to the COVID-19 affected returning migrant workers and their family members. Recovery and advancement of informal sector employment. This is a project objective of the project is to ensure economic, social and psychosocial reintegration of returning migrant workers who return. Now I am going to talk about the legal and policy framework. Dear the representative of Bangladesh, please, uh, you have already one minute extended. Please wrap okay. up. Thank you very much. I am going to cut short of my speech. I have shared this written statement with the organizers, so they will be able to show it for the uh, host. I am uh, making it shorter. The, according to the legal policy framework, we have developed Overseas Employment and Migration Act, Wage Earners Welfare Board Act, Overseas Employment and Migrant Recruiting Agent License Rules, Overseas Employment and Migrant Rules, Expatriates Welfare and Overseas Employment Policy 2016. Thank Regarding you so SDG, much. Please wrap up. Thank you. You have already okay. five minutes. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. So uh, next representative to speak, representative of China online. Please prepare your translation quits. Yuni 
。另外呢，我国的主要的数据指标波动有很大，比如说城镇调查失业率一度飙升至二零二零年二月的百分之六点二，当然后来是呃有所回升。三是区域性、行业性还有群体性就业压力加大。四是呢，我国企业的用工规模呢，它是用工的模式，它是趋小，并且是呃趋向灵活化。劳动者呢，求职求稳的心态很明显。农民工呢，外出的意愿是降低的。呃，为应对疫情呢，我国的党和政府呢，实施了系列劳动力市场的政策，主要有以下五个方面：一是呢，着力稳定就业岗位。啊、呃，比如说实施了失业保险稳岗返还、困难人员培训生活费补贴、放宽了技能提升申领的表条件、就业见习的补贴、以工代训的补贴、呃，失业保险保障扩围等政策。第二个方面呢，是着力重点抓好重点群体的就业，对于高校毕业生呢，啊、呃，实施了就业见习补贴、一次性希腊就业的呃补贴、失业保险一次性。扩岗补助，并且呢扩大了三支一扶啊，考研还有专升本入伍的规模。另外呢，对于未就业的毕业生呢，是全面启动了一个服务的攻坚行动。对农民工呢，是开展了点对点的专车专列，并且加大了以工代赈的力度。第三个方面呢，是着力促进了创业和灵活就业，呃，加大了创业贷款贷款的实施力度，并且呢，实行这个限额的税收减免。创业的场地支持、创业载体的奖补等等政策，发放一次性的创业补贴。对于灵活就业方面呢，开展了这个新就业形态的职业伤害的这个试点工作。第四个方面呢，是着力加强职业培训，呃，实施了项目的免费培训的政策，发放了职业技能的鉴定补贴、职业的培训补贴等等。第五个方面呢，就是着力强化兜底帮扶。呃，对于就业困难人员的认定标准呢，也是进行一个动态的调整，利用这个公益性的岗位呢，来托底的安置，继续实施失业保险保障的扩围政策。当然，随着这个应对疫情系列政策的加快落地呢，各方面呢同向发力，我国的政策的措施呢也是很突出的，效果很突出的。首先就是我国的经济呢，尽快恢复了增长，由负转正，并且呢，我国稳定了就业，比如说城镇新增就业目标的这些呃如期啊、呃、按时的进行了完成，呃，调查失业率呢也回落了，呃，另外呢，改善了供需两侧，促进了消费和再生产，创造了一些一系列的新的职业和新的就业岗位。另外呢，就是对我国的这个稳就业的政策体系呢进行了丰富的完善，为中国“十四五”的良好开局呢提供了有力的保障。以上就是我的发言，谢谢大家。I thank you very much, representative of China. Next to speak, please, uh, representative of Philippines, take the floor. Good morning. Uh, the Republic of the Philippines strongly recognizes the timely discussion and call to immediate action for the formation of healthy, protected, and productive workforce in our country and in our region at large. Its relevance is foremostly set within the context of our changing population age structure, where the proportion of our working age is steadily increasing and is already at 64% in 2020, providing the prospect of demographic dividend and socioeconomic development in the country. Given this, the administration of President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. has set the country's overall development goal to reinvigorate job creation, poverty reduction by steering the economic economy back to its high growth path and true economic transformation for a prosperous, inclusive, and resilient society for the Filipinos. Over the medium term, the agenda of the new administration will focus on creating jobs with security and social protection aimed at retaining an adequate and productive workforce for the country. This aims to create job opportunities for Filipinos as productivity enhancing investments will be promoted while exercising prudence in fiscal management. For this, the retooling and reskilling of the workforce, as well as the institution of effective job facilitation processes to increase the employability of job seekers will be strategically pursued. Finally, special attention will be given to the development of sustainable technologies to create green jobs and establish livable communities. As with the rest of the world, the Philippines is experiencing the continuing inflationary pressures from both global and domestic sources. 
to arrest inflation, the country is exerting its efforts to address constraints in food, energy, and transportation, and logistics sectors to ensure that there is enough supply of basic goods and services that is affordable and accessible to all. As an example, subsidies for public transportation, especially in metropolitan areas, are being provided to support the workforce in their economic activities. We are likewise in a process of intensifying the implementation of our universal health care law to improve the health and productivity of the current workforce, to continuously improve the quality of the human resource and regaining the learning loss during the pandemic, the country has now already opened the face-to-face -face classes at all levels. Our Department of Education is likewise in a process of improving its educational curriculum to focus on foundational skills to adapt to the di digital revolution. It's also working to expand the alternative learning system to support dropouts and other segments of population who want to continue learning. Our Technical Education and Skills Development Authority is now promoting the reskilling and upskilling programs for displaced workers, out-of-school youth, and persons with disability to improve their employability or engagement in gainful economic activities. We are likewise improving our government internship programs to provide opportunities for new graduates to gain shop, laboratory, or internship experiences. For the social protection of workers, the country is continuously strengthening the core functions of poverty reduction and human capital investment of the Pantawid Pamilyang Filipino Program, or the 4Ps. In, re in relation to this, we are expediting the adoption of the national ID system and the facilitation of the digital transformation of social protection systems to allow for a more efficient targeted and equitable delivery of social programs. Efforts are also being done to strengthen social protection um, delivery to be more adaptive and responsive to needs by streamlining contingency financing mechanisms, establishing a dynamic social registry, and defining business processes for national and local governments. Ms. Ma, Madam Chair, while we are also aware that the Philippines is a major source of health workers around the world, the government is exerting efforts through mutual agreements to improve the status, welfare, protection, and benefits of our overseas health workers while balancing our domestic needs. We remain committed to the support uh, endeavors of the international cooperation such as the South-to-South -South cooperation with interested countries for ensuring health, protection, and productivity of the workforce in Asia and the Pacific. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Representative of Philippines. I see no other country members uh, requesting the floor, so that's, this is why I will go further with the international organizations. First to speak is ILO invited to make their statement. Afterwards, uh, ITUC will take the floor. Madam Chair, Excellencies, Distinguished uh, Delegate, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the International Labour Organization, uh, the UN agency that has as its mandate the objective of working towards the achievement of decent work for all. As a topic of this discussion, strategies for building a healthy, protected, and productive workforce in Asia and the Pacific is one that is close to our heart. Let me first congratulate ESCAP for bringing it to the attention of this important forum, and also for raising the bar of social protection as a necessary tool for social development in agenda item three. The session paper sets out very well the challenges that confront us in this region. We are a region where most people do work, but where such work can rarely be qualified as decent. We report year after year that most countries in the Asia Pacific region have still high rates of informal employment, low coverage of social protection, and weak platforms for functioning of social dialogue. Such gaps mean that employment does not come with the value added of income security. This, in turn, limits social advancement and economic prosperity on all levels. This was a situation before the crisis, and it is continuing since the crisis. So how do we change things? This is a question that the ILO has been grappling with for many, many decades. How do we improve the life of people, help enterprises to flourish, and economies to prosper through decent work and social justice? Unfortunately, there is no one clear pathway to making this happen. 
but we have gotten closer at understanding what are the building blocks on which a decent work laid inclusive growth transformation can happen. So much of it has to do with making choices to prioritize investment in effective labor market institutions and empowering social partners, workers, and employers to be part of the conversation in the formulation and implementation of development policies and strategies. The ILO member states, along with social partners, have good roadmaps in the form of recent adopted frameworks, such as the ILO Global Call to Action for Human Center Recovery and the Centenary Declaration for the Future of Work. As you know, the ILO operates through a system of tripartism. This means all the labor conventions and resolutions that have been adopted and ratified at the country level have been negotiated among governments, employers, and workers. This, I feel, gives such instruments a gravitas, a weight to the operationalization of policy making towards the betterment of all segments of society. Let us make use of these instruments and work together at country and regional level to transform a future of work that fosters social justice and inclusive growth. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, distinguished delegate from ILO. Please, uh, Q, um, ITUC Asia Pacific. Thank you, Madam Chair, for inviting the Labour to speak. The International Trade Union Confederation Asia Pacific, representing workers and trade union in the region, would like to appreciate the report of the agenda item two, recognizing rampant and persistent decent work deficit in Asia and the Pacific. I also want to highlight the social outlook 2022 includes a clear reference to the fundamental principles and rights at work, including freedom of association, the collective bargaining rights, safe and healthy working environment, elimination of all forms of forced labor, child labor, and any discriminatory practices at work. In addition, the outlook also underlines a just transition and social dialogue. A healthy, protected, productive workforce can only be guaranteed under decent work, since decent work is a productive work for all, regardless of the employment, status, race, sex, color, age, etc., in condition of freedom, equity, security, and human dignity, based on employment, workers' rights, social protection, and social dialogue. Therefore, decent work is the foundation stone for sustaining economic growth with social development being ensured. In this regard, we support the recommendation in the report which are in line with our demand for a new social contract with jobs, rights, social protection, equity, equality, and inclusion. In particular, now I, today I would like to reiterate that building strong labor market institutions complying with all fundamental rights is an essential prerequisite for a right-based and human-centered recovery with a just transition towards sustainable and inclusive development. Collective bargaining is the most effective institution to protect workers to better working conditions as well as to adopt, adopt new changes. Beyond an enterprise level, the scope of the collective bargaining is also to cover sectoral, regional, national, and even cross-border dialogues. Without realizing occupational safety and health, it is imp impossible to have a healthy, protected, workforce and, I mean, productive workforce. We, we must remember almost three million workers are killed by occupational diseases and accidents every year. To realize this and work is critical in broadening the income tax base and creating feasible contributory systems for social protection, including health care. Furthermore, social dialogue is an, is an institution to guarantee needs of workers in various policies, including active labor market policies. It is not surprising that there are many studies providing the proof that strong labor market institutions measured by the union density are negatively correlated with income inequality. Madam Chair, increasing informality and precarity in employment as well as the disguised self-employed are a result of having undermined the fundamental right of workers. Asia and the Pacific is the region with the least ratification rate of the ILO fundamental conventions, including convention number 87 and number 98 on freedom of association and collective, right, collective bargaining right. 
regarding Convention on Occupational Safety and Health, have ratified by only nine countries among 36 ILO member countries in the region. Madam Chair, therefore, the, Asia, the ITUC Asia Pacific ask the committee to identify the need of ratifying and implementing IRO's fundamental conventions as an a, a, appropriate place to embark on our journey to implement the recommendation for decent work to ensure the workforce we need for sustainable and inclusive future for all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Next to speak um, is um, South Asian Disability Forum. Uh, then be prepared Development, Welfare and Research Foundation. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. And on the back Backdrop of the decent work and the healthy workforce, healthy, protected, and uh, productive workforce in the Asia Pacific region, we can see that, and we have seen the trends that in South Asian countries, uh, most of the employment opportunities offered to the youth are informal opportunities because of their, there are two big major reasons. First of all, the lack of skill development opportunities for the youth. And on the other hand, the transition from uh, formal employment opportunities toward the in information technology and uh, digitalization. And when we when we look at the trend of the falling people with the, the falling trend in the employment opportunities in the region, people with disabilities are out of the picture and totally. They are not they are not able to access the employment opportunities because of these two reasons. So this is the time, like we have seen in the last decade, in almost 15 years, despite the growth in GDP, the environment opportunities has fallen, and people with disabilities are not counted at all. There are very few, very limited opportunities created by the corporate sector. Though we are satisfied that we have some legislation in the South Asian countries in the last 10 years uh, to protect or to ensure the environment opportunities, but they are not backed by the social protection schemes. They are not backed by the disability management costs. So if we really need to engage the workforce with disability in the productive environment and the growth of the country, we have to uh, uh, include them with the whole package, with a holistic approach, with universal social protection coverage and their disability management costs. And plus, then we have to focus on their skill development uh, to cope with this transition from the uh, formal workforce to the ICT. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, next to speak is a representative from Development Welfare and Research Foundation. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I voice my concerns related to India, but applicable uh, to South and East Asia too, from the perspective of a researcher and advocate for the rights of older people, representing my NGO, Development, Welfare and Research Foundation. What seems important to me is that while there has been progress in building a healthy, protected and, pro uh, protected and productive workforce, yet we need to introduce many livelihood opportunities for aging populations and a variety of social protection schemes in the informal sector where a substantial portion of uh, aging populations work and who pertinently need focus on elevating poverty, inequality, and improving household consumption from a healthy aging perspective and with a, uh, uh, and, uh, and, uh, with a gender sensitive focus. 
the emphasis on life cycle schemes for working age segments taking care of older ages is the need of the hour. Last two years, experiences during COVID pandemic times indicates that certain measures were taken to protect and enhance social security, but these had more of welfare tokenism rather than being a development-oriented strategy. There is need to put in place secure contractual mechanisms between the workforce and their employers so that those working can get health care provisions which contribute towards their better health status as well as enhance quality of life. The linkages between decent employment avenues mm -hmm. with multiple age requirement options, opportunities for midlife skill development and universal social protection coverage should be strengthened and available to the whole of adult population. Protection of working and disability rights at all employment facilities has yet to be put in place as much as regulation of wages, timely delivery of these and access to universal social security measures have to be streamlined in countries. The gaps between employment and pensions, social security, not being par with standard of living index and not including health security have to be narrowed down urgently. Besides, adult and digital literacy has to be made universal and an empowering strategy for aging populations in remote, rural and urban areas. Thank you. Thank you so much, representative um, of Development Welfare and Research Foundation. Well, now we have had a request from uh, IFSW, International Federation of Social Workers, um, but he got offline. So with that, the list is finished. I see no other representative uh, wishing to speak. With that, ladies and gentlemen, we are 20 minutes earlier on time. So um, I would like to thank the distinguished delegates for their informative statements, which underline the importance of building a resilient workforce uh, to better respond to ongoing and emerging global trends with foundations in universal healthcare, a green and just transition towards decent employment and an extension um, of social protection to all. Before we adjourn for a break, uh, lunch break, uh, and reconvene to consider agenda item three, I would like to invite the secretary uh, to provide some housekeeping announcements if you have some. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is just uh, to remind participants that the afternoon session will commence at 2 p.m. Thank you. Thank you so much. The meeting is adjourned. <laughs>